If you've ever watched Scream 4 and wondered how it was possible for either of the killers to have gotten around so quickly without the use of teleportation or seemingly being in two locations at the same time, this video will answer all of your questions and tell you exactly which of the two killers was responsible for each phone call and murder. What is up Scream Team, Zach Cherry here. Guys, I started this channel because I'm a huge horror geek and if you're like me, you might want to consider hitting that subscribe button and turning on those bell notifications so you can stay up to date with all my latest videos. Just a heads up, this video will contain spoilers for Scream 4, a movie that at the time of this recording is 9 years old. That was your warning. However, if you've already seen the previous episodes in this series for Who Killed Who and Scream, you'll know that I've pointed out that Wes Craven planned his direction with laser precision right down to the smallest detail and had a very specific vision for which killer was intended to be behind the mask in every shot. This was most evident in the original, but there was definitely a decline in this quality as we made our way through the sequels, not by any fault of Craven himself, but rather in dealing with studio meddling, rushed productions, and constant rewrites. I'm prefacing this breakdown by reminding you of that because when it comes to Scream 4, there are many instances where this movie seems to break the space-time continuum when it comes to placing the killers. But if you pay close enough attention attention. The clues are there. So with that in mind, toss this video a thumbs up and meet me in the comments down below to let me know when you think Ghostface was Charlie and when you think it was Jill. The movie starts off proper with a return to the town of Woodsboro, where Marnie spends the night at her BFF Jenny's house as they begin to watch the latest entry in the Stab franchise. I want to let you guys know that for this breakdown, I watched both the theatrical cut and an extended cut of the film in order to optimize the context of each scene to paint a clearer picture of Jill and Charlie's plot. You can find a link to that extended cut in the descriptions, but I will be referencing the deleted and alternate scenes quite a bit here, just so you know. For example, there are two versions of this opening, and I'm going to expand on both of them since the original version was actually referenced later on in the movie. In the original scene, after Jenny pranks Marnie, who abruptly screams and disconnects the line, Jenny rushes downstairs to find the lights out, the patio doors open, and Marnie lying in front of the couch, playing dead. The girls laugh it off and agree to stop scaring one another. As Marnie gets up to grab some more snacks, Ghostface creeps in through the open patio doors and stabs Jenny multiple times while Marnie looks on incredulously. As the reality of the situation starts to sink in for her, she makes a run for the front door where Ghostface catches up to her, delivering a stab to the chest before finishing her off. The opening wasn't reshot until after principal filming was finished, so in the scene where Jill and Charlie are unmasked, Asked, Charlie shows the footage of Marnie's death to Sydney, which is identical to the way she dies here. If we look closely at the video on his phone, we can see that the camera is stationary, likely similar to the one we see later on at the Stabathon, meaning that at some point earlier that night, Charlie would have snuck into Jenny's house and set up that camera. We know that Charlie and Jill were also using head cams that were hidden under their masks, but we're never shown any of this footage in the movie. We also know that this particular ghost face would be Charlie, as he basically implies that he was responsible for the deaths of Jenny. Marnie, Olivia, and Robbie, as he states this footage of the Robbie kill was his best yet. Even though we see a shadow run past the window before Ghostface enters the house, a shot which was used in both versions of the scene, there's no evidence that confirms or disproves Jill was there in this version. But if we look at the version used in the finished film, it would definitely suggest more involvement on her part. So going back to the moment before the scene was altered, Jenny comes downstairs to investigate Marnie's scream. She finds the lights out and Marnie nowhere in sight, as the killer calls the landline from Marnie's cell phone. I'm gonna say that this is Jill calling, as we're given a little bit more context here as to why Jenny has been targeted. Based on her line asking if the caller is Trevor, followed up later by Olivia referencing Jenny as the other woman, we can surmise that Jenny is the girl who Trevor cheated on Jill with. This would also substantiate Jill's plan to frame Trevor, as he had a previous connection with the victim. Since we don't actually see Marnie's death on screen in this version, we can presume that it was still Charlie who murdered her and then dragged her body outside, as it's always implied later on that it was his his kill. Given the timing of the call and Marnie's body being thrown through the patio doors, I'd imagine that Charlie probably did this too, if it was Jill on the phone, as there's no way the killer could have done both simultaneously. As Jenny's murder is later implied to be committed by Charlie as well, that would also make him the ghost face that chases her into the house and ultimately kills her in the garage. I know a lot of people think that this was Jill based on some sort of revenge bloodlust, but I disagree, and I'll explain why at the end of the video. 
We're then reintroduced to Sydney when we see her and her publicist Rebecca arrive at the bookshop the next morning. Based on a line of dialogue from a deleted scene later on where Sydney declines Rebecca's invitation to stay at the hotel room she'd booked for her, we can surmise that the two had arrived from the airport that morning and drove directly to the bookshop from the car rental. That would indicate to us that the killer would have had to leave the crime scene evidence in the car after the two had already arrived. Based on the fact that Jill was picked up at home by Kirby while Charlie's whereabouts were unknown prior to arriving at school, we can tell that Charlie would have been the one who vandalized the car. It should be noted that in a deleted scene after the police find the bodies of Jenny and Marnie, Hicks reveals that their cell phones are missing and that she's going to get the phone company to perform a trace. We know that Charlie calls Jill from Jenny's phone while the girls are driving to school, and based on what Olivia says, she received a similar call from Marnie's phone earlier that morning. When the police eventually locate the phone signal to the rental car, they find only one cell phone in the trunk. I'm gonna say that this was Marnie's, since Charlie wouldn't have had any more use for it after calling Olivia, and would have planted it before heading to school. He then would have destroyed Jenny's phone after calling Jill, arriving just in time for classes, but also before the phones could be traced. As for the reason why they would plant the crime scene evidence in Sydney's rental car in the first place, it was to ensure that Sydney wouldn't be able to leave Woodsboro, as she initially wanted to, as it made her a material witness in the murders. This was obviously a key detail in Jill's plan, with Sydney ultimately being her main target. At some point that afternoon or evening, Charlie breaks into Trevor's house and steals his cell phone. This is implied in a deleted scene at the hospital, when Trevor tells Jill that he couldn't find his phone before he went out that night. We know that Trevor's phone was used to call Jill before Olivia's murder, and Kirby later implies that Trevor is lying about receiving a text invitation from Jill because he had apparently lost his phone. He clears this up by stating that he had since gotten a new one, so that should indicate to us that all the phone calls placed at least on this night were made by Charlie from Trevor's phone. With that in mind, Charlie heads over to Olivia's house before she arrives. He sets up his camera as he had previously done at Jenny's house, and we'll do again later at the Stabathon, which will capture the footage of Olivia's murder. Now, this is where things get really frustrating for me because everything would have been fine had it not been for this bullshit afterwards. I saw him going to that yard two houses down right before. And I circled around to cut him off. This is what I'm talking about when I say the killer not only had teleportation powers, but was seemingly in two locations at the same time, because I now have to somehow explain how Charlie was able to create a diversion to get the cops to run down the street, even though they were sitting in their car when Olivia got home and entered her house, where she immediately went to her room while the scene was still playing out in real time with Jill and Kirby next door. And we have to believe that Charlie would have somehow still been hiding in Olivia's closet the entire time. So based on Haas and Perkins' account of what happened, we can assume that after Olivia entered her house, Charlie ran down the street in order to lure them away. In a deleted scene that precedes this one, we see Dewey conduct a test for his deputies to see how long it takes them to answer the front door. Realizing that it took 15 seconds and wanting to get it down to 10, he instructs them to make sure at least one of them circles around from the back of the house for the next time. This is said within earshot of Jill, who would then have relayed this information to Charlie so he could be one step ahead of the cops. This explains why Haas chased Charlie two houses down, while Perkins circled around in an attempt to cut him off. Charlie knew he would do this, and hopped a fence to double back to Olivia's house, where he was able to sneak in after she was already home and hid in her closet, somehow in this short span of uninterrupted time. Okay, now that I've explained all that, let's get on with the easy part. Charlie hides in Olivia's closet, where he makes the call to Jill from Trevor's phone, which is picked up by Kirby. With Charlie barely being audible on account of him whispering so he's not to be heard by Olivia, he surprise bursts out of the closet and goes to town on the poor girl, before hiding in the adjacent bedroom as Wonder Woman Sydney comes barreling in too little too late. I always thought the killer who calls Sydney here was Jill, just based on the timing of how she calls out to Sydney moments after Ghostface hangs up, but upon further review, I'm gonna say this call was made by Charlie, and here's why. As I mentioned, all of the calls are still being made from from Trevor's phone, which would still be in Charlie's possession. Charlie calls Olivia's phone for Sydney to pick up and echoes a very specific line which was used by the character in another deleted scene that occurred earlier that day. This is real life, okay? This isn't a movie. One day, it will be. This isn't a fucking movie. It will be. Since there's no way Jill would have gotten the phone from Charlie as she hadn't entered the house yet and there was no other phone being used by the killer at this point, Jill arriving when she did was just lucky timing on her part. After Jill comes upstairs to survey the scene, Charlie jumps out and slashes her arm in order to remove any suspicion of her involvement. Sydney fends him off and after tumbling down the stairs and getting high kicked in the face, he manages to jet out the back door while Haas and Perkins saunter in, followed by Trevor, who's just kind of been lingering around. Seriously, they don't even need to try this hard to frame the dude. He's doing all the work for them. 
Charlie then meets up with Robbie, where the two of them arrive together at the hospital. Fortunately, this next bit is going to be much easier for me to break down, as it's established in a lengthy deleted scene that Jill spends the entire time in the hospital's emergency room. This does indicate to us that Charlie is the one who kills Rebecca in the parking garage, as he would have easily been able to separate from Robbie, and would have still had Trevor's phone, which he uses to call her. I imagine that as well as disabling Rebecca's rental car, he had also loosened the handle on the exit door in preparation for her making a run for it. Charlie then would have hit off to the side of the car, setting off the alarm after she got out and giving her enough of a head start before popping up, as we can see in an extended version of the scene, and running in for the kill. Let's talk a little bit about Jill's scheme. Her main target here is, of course, Sydney, but since she's planning on framing Trevor, and Charlie, unbeknownst to him, she needs to posture herself as the main target in their hypothetical scheme. That way, when Jill succeeds at killing Sydney, the murder will appear incidental, or likely be chalked up to Sydney being in the wrong place at the wrong time. However, Sydney has a protective circle around her that first needs to be thinned out in order for Jill to get her alone in the end. This is why Rebecca had to die. Unfortunately for the disgraced publicist, Jill and Charlie weren't aware that Sydney had already dismissed her and probably could have saved themselves the hassle of having to kill her if they had already known about that beforehand. After Rebecca though, the next person who would be the most likely to get in the way would be Gail. For that reason, Charlie baits her into following him to the Stabathon to get her as far away from Sydney as possible and throw the police off by creating a false ending. With all the scenes of Ghostface that take place at the Stabathon, it's pretty obvious that this is Charlie again, as Jill would still be at home, as we even see her calling Kirby from her bedroom. I just wish they did a better job cutting the scene together, since after Gail watches Charlie disable her cameras in his Ghostface costume, we cut back to him mingling with the partygoers out of costume before putting it on again to attack Gail. It's not impossible, but just feels a little too Superman Clark Kent for my liking. After this, Dewey arrives at the barn and breaks up the party while Charlie makes a daring escape amidst all the pandemonium. Now, let's just put a pin in this moment for a hot sec, cause we gotta go check in on Jill and Sydney. Technically, this scene takes place before the Stabathon, but there is a very bizarre moment here that should be referenced. After Sid and Jill have their heart to heart, Jill exits the kitchen, announcing that she's going upstairs to her room. No sooner does this happen, that Sydney spies a mysterious silhouette in the living room that's reflected in the window. We know that Sydney is prone to some pretty outlandish hallucinations, but I'm gonna say this was Jill, who did not actually go upstairs at this moment, and instead snuck around the main level in order to survey what her best exit strategy might be, as we already saw her scoping out the cops at the start of the scene. She does eventually go up to her room where she calls Kirby, but we won't actually see Jill again until we get to the after party, and this is where things do get a little fuzzy, so bear with me. Since we don't actually see Kate in the house at any point here, we can assume that she's been out at the store this whole time. This lets us know that Jill is lying to Kirby when she texts her to say her mother is driving her crazy, as this is primarily an excuse to get Kirby to come pick her up. It's also a way for Jill to bait Sydney into walking into a trap later on, as she conspicuously leaves her laptop open with this conversation on the screen for her to read. Even considering all the loose variables we have going on here, I'm gonna say that Kirby did actually come and pick Jill up way before Kate got home. And this is how it would have played out chronologically. After the police broke up the stabathon, Jill would have had to wait for Charlie to call her and let her know he stabbed Gail and got away. She would then need to message Kirby to come pick her up, who would also just be leaving the stabathon. Jill would then sneak out of her bedroom window in between Haas and Perkins' perimeter checks of the house, and then to fill in the blanks, I'm gonna say she would probably run down to the end of the street where she called Kirby to give her an exact location of where to find her, after which the two of them would have drove directly to Kirby's house. So as you've probably pieced together from that, I'm gonna place these next three murders on Charlie. And this is where a lot of you are gonna go apeshit, but let me explain. In a deleted scene, we can see that Robbie and Charlie arrived at the barn together, with Charlie being the passenger in Robbie's car. Since Robbie was Charlie's ride and not the other way around, Charlie wouldn't have to be accountable for him after the stabathon. And with the ensuing chaos that takes place, he could have easily lost Robbie in the crowd, where he then would have made his way over to Jill's house, possibly on foot. Kirby still would have gotten there before him to pick up Jill. However, it needs to be reasoned that at some point, Jill had persuaded Kirby to invite Charlie 
and Robbie to come over as well. We don't know their whereabouts before arriving at Kirby's house, but since we do know Kirby drove to her house with Jill, this at least accounts for Jill's whereabouts between the Stabathon and the after party, and that in itself is very telling. We also know that the cops were still alive when Kate arrived home, as she mentions to Sydney that they had disappeared when she returned to her car for the last bag of groceries. So placing Charlie at the scene, after Kate pulls up to the house, which were never shown, Charlie waits across the street for Haas to return to the cop car, where he lunges towards him and takes him and Perkins out in a one-two stab. He then takes one of their guns, as we see him handing it off to Jill later on, and drives their bodies in the car two blocks down the street, as stated by Hicks, who calls it into Dewey. This would also explain why Kate tells Sydney the cops weren't there when she went back to her car. We can assume Charlie would no longer be able to use Trevor's phone, since it would have been replaced by this point, so I'm guessing he's using one of the officer's cell phones when he calls Jill's house here. During this time, Kate is busy fixing the wind chimes, as they were dismantled before she went back to her car, but we can later see that they're hanging up again. Charlie would have likely gone around to the back porch with the intent to kill her next, but because Sydney calls out to her, it ends up drawing her inside the house. This explains why Charlie is still at the back door when they go to leave, and is seen by Sydney through the reflection in the wind chimes. Some of you might say that there are two killers here, and you know, fair, Charlie would basically have to warp from the back door to the front door, but with all the confusing editing going on in this scene, it's much easier for me to believe that he ran around the side of the house super fast than it is for me to believe that this would would be both him and Jill, or that Jill would be killing people right outside of her house while she's still waiting for Kirby to come get her. If you are a staunch believer that this was Jill, I invite you to change my mind. Honestly, send me graphs or diagrams. Make sense of this scenario to me. I'm open to the idea, but until someone convinces me otherwise, this could only have been Charlie. Sydney even slams the door on his arm pretty hard, something that would definitely leave a bruise. And seeing as how Jill's sleeves are rolled up and Charlie's are not, I bet you he's hiding a pretty nasty welt under there. Also, for anyone saying that Jill admitted to killing Kate, the line wasn't, I killed my own mother, it was actually, I mean, for fuck's sake, my own mother had to die. That to me implies she had Charlie do the deed, otherwise she would have taken credit for it herself. At this point, Hicks is driving up to the house and sees Charlie at the front door. From the look of the exterior shot we see next, it would appear that she would have pulled into Olivia's driveway and jumped out of her car to pursue him on foot. We can see that Charlie runs by the window on the right Right side of the house, and when Sydney runs out the back door, she bumps into Hicks, who was running up from the left side of the house, in hopes of intercepting him. As we don't see him at the back of the house, that means he likely knew Hicks ran around the other side, and doubled back to the front, pulling his disappearing act for the fourth time now, and from here we can only assume he met up with Robbie again to head over to Kirby's house. Something interesting to note, Sydney doesn't appear to own a cell phone in this movie. I like to think that was a creative choice on Wes Craven or Kevin Williamson's part, like Sydney is just so over receiving phone calls from psycho killers that she's chosen to be phoneless, but you'll notice it was either Olivia's cell or the Roberts landline that she picks up. She even asks Jill to borrow her cell phone later on, where she finally does call Dewey, but this would explain why she didn't call him on her way to Kirby's, as she wouldn't have been able to. As far as how Sydney even knew where Kirby lived, I'm going to assume that Kate had her address on some in-car navigation system, which is honestly good enough reasoning for me. This would also explain why it took her so much longer to get to Kirby's house than it did for Charlie, who would have already known the location from Kirby having invited him. We now cut to mid-conversation at Kirby's house, where the four young characters have gathered. Even though it seems like they all just arrived, we can deduce that the scene picks up momentarily after Charlie and Robbie had gotten there, as Charlie purposefully left the front door unlocked, which he then apologizes for when Trevor walks right in. This would mean the girls had been there for some time, where Jill would have already texted Trevor much earlier to come over. I do like the attention to detail here, showing us the killers aren't actually drinking, as they would need to stay sharp for all the slight and dicing they're about to do. Also, there's a nice callback to the first movie, with Trevor wearing the exact same outfit as Neil Prescott. Easy to miss on the first go around, but they offer subtle clues to what everyone's role is going to be. Very nice work, Mr. Craven. Jill ponders here whether she might have left her phone in Kirby's car on the drive over, but is actually trying to lure Trevor away from the group. We see in a deleted scene that after they go outside, he offers to help look for her phone, where she sends him to the backyard to see if he can find 
find it there. I believe her plan here was to change into her costume and attack and subdue him, but this is temporarily thwarted when Robbie decides to wander around the property, causing her to hold off. We even see Jill as Ghostface lurking in the bushes through Robbie's head cam. Obviously, this was her as Charlie was still inside at the time with Kirby. Jill then comes back inside the house and goes upstairs, and although we don't see this happen, Kirby confirms this to Trevor when he comes inside asking if anyone had seen her. Charlie, seemingly annoyed about being cock-blocked, takes off while Trevor continues to annoy Kirby before finally going upstairs to find Jill. It's here where we can assume that Jill knocked out and gagged him since we don't see him again until he's pulled out of the pantry. Although she wouldn't have been able to drag him downstairs to hide just yet, so she probably left him up in one of the bedrooms. Charlie, who's now changed into his costume, exits the house through the front door where he bumps right into Robbie and stabs him multiple times, causing him to stumble just off side of the front porch. As this is happening, Sydney pulls up in Kate's car and Charlie hides out of sight. Kirby, who thinks she's heard a noise, gets up to investigate, but is temporarily distracted by Jill coming downstairs. I would imagine Jill's next step here was to keep Kirby at bay until Charlie was able to pick her off, but Sydney must have arrived much earlier than expected, as they're now evenly numbered. Not knowing his next move, Charlie runs back up to the front door, forcing Sydney, Jill, and Kirby to run into the house rather than away from it. With Kirby staying on the main level where she tries to call the police, Charlie chases Sydney and Jill upstairs, where Jill leads her into Kirby's bedroom to avoid her finding Trevor, who's still likely tied up in one of the other rooms. This is where Sydney asks for Jill's phone, which she uses to call Dewey while Jill hides under the bed. Charlie, who's now broken through the door, chases Sydney out onto the roof where he circles around the other side to cut her off, causing her to fall off the ledge. As she runs back into the house, she bumps into Kirby, where they hear a strange banging noise coming from upstairs, before moving down to the basement. This would be the sound of Jill and Charlie lugging Trevor down to the main level, where they're now able to hide him in the pantry. Jill then gets Charlie to give her his costume, and the two run out back, staging Charlie's attack for Sydney and Kirby to see. After Jill ties him up, she uses his phone to call Kirby, while Sydney goes back upstairs. Obviously, we know what happens next here as Charlie reveals himself before stabbing Kirby, but while he makes his way back around to the front of the house, Sydney hears what sounds like a door closing in the basement. Although some people believe this was Kirby who somehow survived and crawled back into the house to lock herself in that room, I think it's more likely that this was Jill who was just making sure that everyone was dead so she could finally reveal herself to Sydney as the mastermind without there being any witnesses. Now, I know what you're thinking, we have Marnie, Jenny, Olivia, Rebecca, Haas, Perkins, Kate, Robbie, and obviously Kirby, all killed by Charlie. But before you cry foul and say that I'm not giving Jill the proper credit she deserves, I fully went into this believing that Jill had a much bigger hand in committing these murders, and I was even rooting for her to have a high kill count. If you've seen my Ghostface rankings, which I feel I should reevaluate now, you know I'm a Jill supporter, so I'm not trying to taint her reputation here. I have approached this movie very logically, as I have for all of them now, and from what I can see here, it was very important in Jill's scheme that she got as little blood on her hands as possible. And for that reason, she would have manipulated Charlie into doing all of the killings for her. Even Jenny's, if you believe she had a personal vendetta against her. Other than Sydney, the only people that Jill would have killed were Trevor and Charlie, which she would have claimed was either self-defense or that they had killed each other. And as I said with Sydney, if the intent was to make it appear as though she died while coming to Jill's rescue, she would have gotten away with it too, if it hadn't been for those meddling kids. Jill might not have had the best resume when it came to the kills, but she had the brains. And that, my friends, is all the information we need to know who killed who in Scream 4. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Up next, we'll be diving into the Halloween franchise with my personal ranking of all 11 movies. Stay tuned for that, or check out my Patreon for bonus content made weekly just for you. I've been Zach Cherry, and I'll be right back.